Le nouveau développement en Allemagne donne un exemple saisissant de la politique fondamentale forte de la direction du prolétariat. Assimilation de la démocratie au fascisme, répudiation de la politique de front unique et par suite renonciation au Soviet. After four and a half years' exile in Turkey, Trotsky obtained a visa to live in France. He took a secluded house at Barbizon, outside Paris. He knew that his life was in danger from Stalin and his agents, and communicated with the outside world by messenger. There were stringent security arrangements. August the 19th, 1936, the first trial opened in Moscow. Among the accused were Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Smirnov. Few could believe what we now know to be the truth, that these confessions were obtained from the former heroes of the revolution by medieval methods of torture. Britain's leading experts on Russia, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, declared during the Moscow trials that after 1930, prisoners were no longer beaten or killed. 150 leading American intellectuals declared in a petition that the Moscow trials and the prisoners' confessions were absolutely true. Walter Duranty wrote, that Stalin's chief prosecutor, Vyshinsky, was a truthful man. Victims of purges and trials from 1928 onwards included all of the revolution's heroes. But Stalin's famines and purges were played down and suppressed by Western governments who needed him to fight Hitler. A campaign of vilification implicating Trotsky in these crimes was organized from Moscow. Trotsky's name was smeared across the pages of the French press. Stalin systematically eliminated every single one of his comrades who had fought for the revolution. Trotsky was now the sole survivor. In June 1935, he obtained a visa for Norway. Under the Soviet threat of economic retaliation, the Norwegian government kept the couple under house arrest. After 18 months, they were deported from Norway to Mexico. They reached Tampico on January the 9th, 1937, to be greeted by the Mexican artist Diego Rivera and his wife, Frida Kahlo. Trotsky had left Europe for the last time, but found in the New World a small band of loyal supporters. Their influence with Mexico's left-wing president, Lázaro Cárdenas, ensured that the Trotskys were taken to Mexico City in the president's official train. The Riveras took the Trotskys to their home, where they stayed for two years. Diego Rivera arranged for a group of Mexican workers to act as bodyguards for their guests. <laughs> Meanwhile, he worked on preparing a public denial of Stalin's accusations of treason. He was helped by Diego Rivera and by American supporters like George Novak. He wanted to know 
what kind of a committee had been set up on his behalf. We explained that we had organized the American Committee for the Defense of Leon Trotsky. It had two objectives. One was to get asylum for Trotsky, which we succeeded in doing. The other was to constitute a commission of inquiry into the charges against him and his son Sadov by uh, Stalin's government. Trotsky began preparing a detailed defense against the charges for which he had been sentenced to death in Moscow and tried in vain to enlist the support of communists throughout the world in his denunciation of Stalin. What is now my principal task? To reveal the truth? To show and to demonstrate that the true criminals hide under the cloak of the accusers? What will be the next step in this direction? The creation of an American, an European, and subsequent also an international commission of inquiry, composed of people who incontestably enjoy authority and public confidence. I undertake to present to such a commission all my files, thousands of personal and open letters in which the, develop, the development of my thought and my actions reflected day by day without any gaps. I have nothing to hide. The inquiry opened in Mexico on April the 10th, 1937. It was chaired by the veteran American philosopher John Dewey, but was notable for the absence of most of Europe's left-wing intellectuals. These trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from Stalinism. That is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. The commission's verdict was very clear and definitive. It said that the charges against the Trotskys were false and the Moscow trials were frame-ups. Despite its verdict, the commission itself was a bitter disappointment to Trotsky. Its findings were largely ignored, both in the United States and in a Europe preoccupied with the Spanish Civil War and the growing menace of Hitler's Germany. But personal tragedy overshadowed all else in early 1938. In February, his elder son, Leon Sidov, Lyova, died in a Paris clinic after an appendicitis operation. His collaborator, Borovsky, known as Stephen, was revealed to be a member of Stalin's secret police. His other son, Sergei, disappeared into the Lubyanka jail in Moscow. In Moscow, Stalin continued his private war against opponents, real and imagined. 25,000 officers were purged as he decapitated the Red Army. Hitler's armies, on the other hand, were ready for war. Trotsky knew that the two dictators would inevitably form an alliance. He tried to counter their barbarism by creating the Fourth International, the World Party of the Socialist Revolution. But a year later, in 1939, Hitler and Stalin made the Nazi-Soviet pact. Having parted from Diego Rivera, Trotsky and his wife moved to a house on the Avenida Vienna in Coyahocan, a suburb of Mexico City. There, he prepared an armed bunker in response to increasingly precise threats to his life.
Trotsky's only other relative, his grandson Sieva, came to stay. Sieva witnessed the first attempt on Trotsky's life on May the 24th, 1940. I was sleeping peacefully in my room next to my grandfather's when the noise woke me up. It was someone who was pushing the door of the lattice window nearby and the noise woke me. It was 4, 4.30 in the morning. A moment later, the shooting started. Machine guns and the house began to reek of cordite. And the whole place smelled like a battlefield. Trotsky escaped injury, although over 200 shots were fired. Suspicion fell on a group of Stalinists in Mexico. Arrested, they confessed to the attempt on Trotsky's life. Trotsky now took extreme precautions, especially when on the move. Soon after the machine gun attack, a newcomer was admitted to Trotsky's entourage. His name was Frank Jackson, a writer introduced to Trotsky by close communist associates. Trotsky was working on his life of Stalin. Jackson asked Trotsky to read some of his work. It was about 5 p.m. on August the 20th, 1940, when Trotsky invited Jackson into his study. Jackson took an ice pick from underneath his raincoat and smashed it into Trotsky's skull. Trotsky fought back, but was mortally wounded. Natalia, hearing screams, found her husband standing in the window, drenched in blood. He told his wife he loved her and collapsed on the floor. Jackson was attacked and beaten by Trotsky's bodyguards. He appeared dazed as he was taken away in an ambulance. He was questioned in hospital by the Mexican police about the motive for his crime. Trotsky went into a coma a few hours after the attack. Natalia was with him until the end. Leon Trotsky died on August the 21st, 1940. Jackson, his assassin, identified as Ramon Mercado, one of Stalin's agents, was sentenced to 20 years in jail. Released in 1960, he was decorated in Moscow with the Order of the Red Banner. In exile, months before his death, Leon Trotsky had remembered the dream. My faith in the communist future of humanity is as ardent as ever. It is, if anything, stronger today than when I was young. Natalia has just come up to the window from the courtyard and opened it wider so that the air may enter more freely into my room. I can see the bright green strip of grass beneath the wall and the clear blue sky above and the bright sunlight everywhere. Life is beautiful. May future generations cleanse it of all evil, oppression and violence and enjoy it to the full.